Okay, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to Genomics Light. This is our first in our cancer research series. Um, so this evening we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth C uh, Coker and we'll be looking at genomics in context um, of cancer research. So uh, welcome to those of you that maybe have joined us on a previous uh, series. I recognize a couple of names um, and welcome as well to anyone who's joining us for the first time. Um, before I hand over to Lizzie, I'm going to uh, run through how uh, the session this evening is gonna work. Um, so just to start off by by saying that all our events are aimed to help everyone explore the science of genomics and what it means for our everyday lives. So we ask that you join us this evening uh, and participate in the spirit of curiosity and sharing, um, but respect everyone else who's in the space. Um, and myself and Fran are here to moderate the space to make sure that everyone is welcome and included in the event. Um, Obviously, this is the first in our cancer series, uh, cancer research series. So um, next week, we'll be looking at how cancer is researched in the lab. The week after, we're looking at the ethics of machine learning and how that is being used in cancer and healthcare. And then to finish off the series, we'll be doing a uh, career panel. So that's really useful for anyone thinking about going into medical research. You've probably spotted that on webinar, you can't use your camera or your microphone this evening. So if you want to get in touch with us, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, if you are answering a question that we ask you or have general comments or have any technical issues, use the chat uh, chat function to, to let us know and we'll help best we can. Um, if you've got any specific questions for Lizzie, um, pop them in the Q&A. It just helps us to find them and we'll do some uh, uh, Q&A at the end as well. So, um, normally, in normal times, we'd be welcoming you to the Welcome Genome Campus, which is based just south of Cambridge. Um, at the moment, it's only essential science that's happening, so we're all still working from home, um, which is really nice because it means we can welcome people from all across the world to join us. So um, if anyone would like to and can find the chat box, uh, let us know where in the world you are joining us from. It's always fun to see who we've got with us today. Awesome, we've got someone else from Cambridge, so nice and local. London, not too far away. Norfolk, Hull. Awesome, we've got a, quite a mix of people from across uh, across the UK. So uh, yeah, welcome to everyone tonight. Um, obviously our scientists come from across the world. So it's really nice to have a mix of people uh, at these events as well. Um, on the campus, we've got two main research institutes. We've got the Welcome Sanger Institute and we've got Emble EBI. Uh, Welcome Sanger is mainly focused on uh, wet lab stuff. So uh, things you might see like pipettes and working in lab hoods. Um, that's what uh, Welcome Sanger does. Uh, Emble EBI is completely focused on uh, data. So uh, all of the scientists that work at Emble uh, work with data and computers to help us understand what's happening in biology. Um, obviously, everything that we do on campus has to do with genomics, hence our name. Um, we have a few different areas of research. We look at genetics, we look at cancer, we look at how cells work. We do a lot on parasites and microbes, which used to be mainly malaria um, and right now is mainly COVID. Um, we do things around the tree of life, so looking at biodiversity and we look at biodata as well. Obviously, a lot of the stuff we'll be looking at this series is from our sort of cancer area. Um, before I finish off and pass on to Lizzie, um, a couple of resources that might be useful to anyone, especially if you're studying for any uh, GCSEs, A-levels, uh, equivalents, or even university. Um, our Your Genome website has loads of fact pages, stories, activities, videos, all about DNA and cells and everything to do with what we, what we work on. Um, we've also got an education update newsletter, and that's the best place to find out when we do new things like this. Um, we'll have another series in, in June, July, so that's the best place to find out about that. You can find us on social media and you can uh, drop an email to us as well. And I'll pop all of these links in the chat box um, at the end of the session so that you can find them nice and easily. Um, but that is all from me. So I will stop sharing and I will pass over to Lizzie uh, to tell you more about the work that she does. Okay, um, thank you very much, Em. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk this evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Lizzie Coker, and I am a scientist at the Welcome Genome Campus. Today, I'm going to be introducing you to the concept of genomics and how we can use that to understand both how cancers form and also how we can use that to treat cancers. So first of all, who am I? 
So I did sciences at A-level, so I know quite a few of you listening to this talk today will be thinking about subjects for A-levels, maybe you'll be thinking about university. So I did sciences at A-level, I then studied for a three-year bachelor's degree in genetics and did a additional one-year master's degree in a subject called systems biology. So I am a scientist rather than a medical doctor, so although I have the title doctor, um, I'm not a clinician, although I do work with quite a few clinicians. So I'm called doctor because I have what's called a PhD. So this is a four year research degree or research project. And I did that in the field of computational biology. So I now work as a postdoctoral researcher. So as a research scientist at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. And I work with data that was generated from experiments that were done in our labs by other scientists. So first of all, I thought we would start off with a question. So the question I'm posing to you is, do you know what the term genomics means? So I think M is going to set up a poll for you. So the answer so is... There should be a poll that's going to pop on your screen. Most people will have found it already. If you're on mobile, I know that sometimes polls are tricky, so you can use the chat box um, if the poll isn't working for you. give you another few seconds to vote there. Looks like we've got a good mix of yes, of course, and maybe, and a couple of no ideas. So a bit of a mix, but most, most people are on maybe. Good, okay, right. So it's good that we've got some maybes and it's absolutely fine we've got some no ideas. That's why you're here, to learn um, and find out about genomics. So as you'll know, within all of the cells of the human body there is something called DNA and this is made up of chromosomes and it's made up of different bases that encode for different genes that can encode for different proteins. So every single cell in the body contains the same DNA with some exceptions but that DNA is as a whole described as what we call a genome and one way of thinking about a genome is sort of like a recipe book. So a genome contains in its DNA code the instructions for making all the different parts of the human body. So for example the instructions on how to make an arm, how to make a liver, how to make specific heart cells, how to make specific muscle cells, how to make different proteins etc. So it's like a recipe book that tells you how to make biscuits, bread, tarts, pastry, cakes, all the different things you can imagine baking. And you have the instructions for all of them in one place. So the human genome contains instructions um, and the code for all the proteins and all the genes that are needed within humans in any one um, cell type. So if you were to look at the human genome, it's a sequence of C's, T's, G's and A's. So if you look, were to look at this, just looking at the code on its own, it doesn't really make very much sense. You have to know what you're looking for and you have to know that, for example, what TTT means here in this title and what CTGAT means. So you have to be able to translate it and interpret it. Since the human genome was sequenced about 20 years ago, we have compiled something that we call the human reference genome. So this is like the, the master recipe book. So this contains the complete human sequence of the genome as a sort of reference, as a standard for human beings. So if you ever go to the Welcome Collection in London, it's really worth a visit, it's a really interesting museum, you might see this bookcase, which is here on the right. So this bookcase is massively tall, it's probably about two, three metres tall, and you can see all of these books that are on these shelves. And if you were to open them up, each one of them probably has about 500 pages, and they are just full from top to bottom, every single page, both sides, with this tiny, tiny, tiny writing, and it's just a sequence of C, T, G and A. And that is a real printout of what we call the human reference genome. 
So the actual recipe book and human reference genome for humans is this massive collection of files and massive collection of books shown here on the right. So if you're ever in London, I definitely recommend going to the Wellcome Collection and having a look at that. So that's a genome as a whole. The field of genomics is the field in which we compare the genomes from one individual to another, or it might be from one cancer tumour to another, or even from one cancer cell to another cancer cell within the, the same tumour. It's about comparing, say, the set of this one bookcase from one person with this bookcase incorporating the code from another person. That's what we call genomics. It's comparing and looking for differences and similarities. Okay. So over the last 20 years, we've undergone something called the DNA revolution. So back in 2001, when the first human reference genome was published, it cost about a billion dollars to get that one sequence completely sequenced and published. So the price per human genome to sequence all of that DNA has been falling quite dramatically. So if you look on the left, this is a log scale. So it's getting small to go down. So if we look at here, it's about 2020, 2021, it currently costs, whereas it initially cost a billion dollars, it now costs around a thousand dollars to sequence a whole human genome. There are variations you can do on that. So sometimes you might be just interested in a certain subset of genes. So you can more cheaply sequence very specific regions, or you might want to sequence the same person over and over and over again to get a really high quality sequence. But the key thing is over the past 20 years, the price of human genome sequencing has massively fallen, which means we can routinely use sequencing in our research to help us understand biology and understand human disease. So you'll probably know that the topic of this talk and the topic of this short series of lectures is cancer. So I'm going to sort of ask you, what do you think cancer is? So I want you to complete the question in the poll. So which of the following do you think are true? So first option, cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell growth. Cancer is a lump. Cancer is a disease or cancer is caused by genetic mutations. So you can select more than one. So select whichever ones you think are true or you think might be true. And we'll look at the results in a minute. So it looks like most people are voting for um, cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell growth mm -hmm. and that it's caused by genetic mutation. There's a good a good amount of votes for both a lump and a disease as well. Um, so don't forget, you can vote for as many as you think are, are, are true. OK, great. OK, so let's move on to look at this in a bit more detail. So what is cancer? Well, first of all, those of you who said cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell growth are absolutely right. Cancer is uncontrolled growth of cells in a particular location within the body. Cancer is indeed caused by genetic mutations. And it's these genetic mutations that can cause the cell and cells to grow excessively. So those of you who said cancer is a disease, yes, it is a disease. But it's often said that cancer is actually a whole family of different diseases. So there are actually over 200 different types of cancer, depending on wells where the cells originate from. So actually, as a cancer researcher, I would consider lung cancer to be a different disease to skin cancer or to bowel cancer or breast cancer and so on. So you could say that cancer is multiple diseases. So not all cancers are solid. So you may have make and think of cancer as, oh, it's a lump or it's a tumour. Um, that is the case for many of what we call solid cancers, solid tumours. So these are breast cancers, lung cancers, ovarian cancers, etc. But you can also have what we call liquid cancers. And these are cancers of the blood, 
primarily. So these are things like leukemias and lymphomas. So in many cases, cancer can be seen as a lump of cells, but not always. So cancer is a disease or diseases that develop over a period of time and they have multiple different stages to their development. So over here on the left, we see a, a piece of tissue. So this might be skin tissue, for example. And in a normal tissue, normal healthy tissue, the cells are also fairly neatly organized in a nice sort of organized structure um, over here. So this might be healthy skin, for example. Once a tumor starts to form, we, this turns into what we call an in situ cancer. So it's just in its location. So here we get some cells that have started to grow, maybe started to get a bit bigger, maybe they look different to the healthy cells that are surrounding it. And over time, this tumor, this cancer cell, these cancer cells may um, undergo a process that we call invasion. So over here on the right, this invasive cancer is where these cancer cells, so the ones with the round shape, not the square shape, have sort of broken through. They've broken through an underlying membrane in the tissue and they've spread into um, say the bloodstream or the lymph system. Um, and they've actually managed to spread and the, those cells are released into the bloodstream and they can move around the body. Over here on the right, um, is describing a process that we call metastasis. So this is where um, cells from a tumour spread throughout the body and they can actually then form secondary tumours. So in the example of skin cancer, cells may break away from the initial tumour, may spread throughout the blood or spread throughout the lymph system and may spread to say brain, lymph nodes, the liver or the bone. And these are what we call metastases or METs, you might have heard of that term. So that's one of the later stages of cancer development. So question time again, how do we treat cancers? So for this question, if you type your answers in the chat and M will read through them and tell me some of the ideas you have. So you probably have heard of some sort of from TV and the media. So any ideas you have for treating cancer, uh, pop them in the chat. So we've got uh, radiation, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgery, mm -hmm. lots of chemotherapies, uh, immunotherapies, I think is yeah, sort of very good. Uh, a nice idea for using stem cell research. Um, Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Someone's put a very specific one that I've not heard of. So immunology and checkpoint inhibitors. Um, yeah, very someone's good. put yeah. literally cutting it out with surgery which I yeah that's a nice uh that's a nice approach and again some very specific ones so um onco oncolytic viruses haven't heard oh, of that yeah. before yeah. um cis transplatinum mm -hmm. haven't yeah. heard of that um uh, hormone therapies mm -hmm. uh monoclonal antibodies well we've got some really really <laughs> specific <laughs> and great ideas in the chat excellent sounds like we've got an expert audience this evening this is fantastic Okay, um, so it sounds like you're all very well informed, this is great. So how has cancer sort of historically been treated? Um, well, there are three main sort of ways in which cancer has been treated up until recently. So first of all, there's surgery, which was mentioned. So that's literally cutting out the tumour, um, which is often very effective. So it's not very sophisticated, but it works. There's also radiotherapy. So you irradiate the tumor or the tumor area. That can also be very effective for certain cancers. And also chemotherapy. So this is where we give toxic drugs to a cancer patient in the hope that it will kill the cancer cells. So again, this can be very effective, but not all cancers are treated the same way. So over the last sort of 50 years or so, survival rates for cancer have massively increased. So in about 1970, only 24% of people with diagnosed with cancer, so any cancer at all, would survive for more than 10 years. And today it's around 50%, which is a massive increase over the sort of 50 year period. However, these survival rates are quite variable depending on the actual tissue of origin of the cancer. So as I was saying, cancer is not necessarily 
um, a single disease. It's lots of different types of the same disease, as it were. So testicular cancer, we have fantastic treatments for testicular cancer and 98% of men diagnosed with testicular cancer will survive for more than 10 years, which is fantastic. However, for pancreatic cancer, um, it's a very different story and around 1% only 1% of people diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will survive for more than 10 years. So it's extremely variable um, in how the disease presents and how the disease is treated and actual survival rates. So conventional chemotherapy um, works by acting on cells that are rapidly dividing. So in a normal tissue, so just to sort of replace damaged cells, to replace cells as they're growing, um, as they wear out, it's sort of normal wear and tear. You'll get one cell divided into two, and there's two divided into four. So that's standard procedure, and it's quite tightly controlled in um, the body to avoid cancers forming. However, when a cancer is forming, you get really rapid cell division. Rapid cell division, um, there's no sort of checkpoint mechanisms there to slow it down and you just get so many cells um, being created through cell division. So the way in which chemotherapy works is it actually effectively poisons cells that are dividing. This means that in a cancer patient the chemotherapy will work on will, and will kill the cells in their cancer but it will also to a degree affect some of their healthy cells. So whilst it will primarily affect the cancer cells, there will also be what we call side effects. So this will affect things like their hair. So quite often people on chemotherapy lose their hair. They quite often have gastrointestinal problems. So vomiting, diarrhea, um, sort of um, tiredness, they can get infertility even. And actually, in some cases, chemotherapies can cause what we call secondary malignancies. So if you're being treated for one type of cancer, your chemotherapy might actually cause a second type of cancer in you many years later, which is awful. So that's a really awful thing to happen to someone who's receiving cancer treatment. And it shows that although chemotherapy is quite, can be quite powerful, it's also a very, very blunt tool. So it doesn't distinguish between the cancer tissue and healthy tissue. So another question for you. Do you think we can make better drugs than chemotherapy to treat cancer? So answers again are yes, no, or it depends. So we've got a, a fairly optimistic bunch. Most people are going mm -hmm. for yes. A uh, couple of no's, which is uh, fair enough, and, and a few depends. But most people are going for yes. We've got quite an optimistic audience. Excellent. That's good. Okay, so I would say, so as a cancer, professional cancer researcher, I'd say the answer to this is definitely yes. And the reason is we already have for certain cancers. So next topic I'm going to talk about is how we can use genomics to make better cancer drugs. So better than these chemotherapies, which effectively just poison so many different cells within the body and can cause these really nasty side effects. So I'm going to talk about something called targeted therapies. So I don't think anyone in the chat sort of specifically mentioned targeted therapies. But these are where you treat with a drug which acts on a specific target protein. So this target protein needs to be either only found in the cancer cells and not in the healthy cells. It might occur at a higher concentration in the cancer cells compared to the healthy cells. Or it might just be more important to cell survival in a cancer cell than a healthy cell. So these targeted therapies will, in theory, mainly just kill the cancer cells. And it also means that in theory, these targeted drugs will have fewer side effects than chemotherapies. So genomics can help us understand why a cancer is growing by identifying the genes that are mutated in it. And by knowing which genes are mutated, we can identify a cancer's weak points. So sort of the good proteins to target. So it's almost like 
if you um, know the, the Greek myth of Achilles, so his weak point was his heel. So if you could target his heel, that's his vulnerability, that's his weak spot. So in order to select the right targeted therapy for the right cancer, you need to know that cancer's weak spot, that's cancer's Achilles heel. However, not all cancers have suitable targets to targeted therapies, and different cancers may need different targeted therapies. So that's something that we can understand through genomics. So I'm going to show you an example here. So this is from a research paper, which was published about 10 years ago now, possibly a little bit longer. So over here on the left, we have a 38 year old man, so fairly young, and he had a melanoma, so skin cancer. Um, and that skin cancer is clearly very advanced. So if you look at his torso, he's got so many different sort of tumors and lumps all over his skin. And he was very, very sick at this point. By sequencing his tumor cells, the doctors were able to discover that he had mutations in a gene called BRAF. By treating him with a drug called PLX4032, which is a very catchy name, which specifically acts on cells and acts on cells and stops their BRAF protein from functioning. After 15 weeks, he looked like the center panel here. So B, you can see completely, his tumors have completely vanished. He looks much more healthy. Um, and it's actually a really dramatic change you can see there. So that shows you quite how effective getting the right targeted therapy can be for treating cancers. So some of you may um, remember a couple of years ago, the actress Angelina Jolie was um, in the papers a lot. And that was because she had ha undergone a double mastectomy. So she had both breasts removed surgically. And this is because she was a carrier for mutations in the BRCA gene. So there are actually two BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And if we look at um, the cancer risk associated with these two genes, yes, there is a very high increased rate of um, breast cancer in carriers of these two genes. But actually, it's also a much higher risk of developing other cancers as well. So you can see um, for carriers of BRCA1 mutations, there's a 40 to 60% risk of developing ovarian cancer. And actually it's not just women who are carriers of the BRCA genes who are at risk of developing cancer. So male breast cancer, um, so men can develop breast cancer, they have a very small amount of breast tissue. Um, so it's much less common than female breast cancer, but it does arise. So male carriers of the BRCA mutations are at risk of male breast cancer and also prostate cancer. Also, both men and women are also have a slightly elevated risk of developing pancreatic cancer if they have the BRCA2 mutation. So how do we know and how does BRCA actually cause cancer? So within your cells, um, DNA quite regularly gets damaged and that's through things like UV light, chemical reactions, the pH changes, all sorts of things can go wrong in the cell, which can damage the DNA strand. And basically, there are many different ways in which the cell repairs its DNA damage. Um, and two of them, which sort of back each other up, are BRCA-mediated homologous recombination and base excision repair. So you don't need to know the details of those two, you just need to know there's two of them. And they sort of back each other up. So if one of them, one of them can function when the other one's not functioning, or the other one can step in when there's not. So that's what we call redundancy. So it's sort of like a backup option there. Um, so cells that have a mutation in BRCA can't repair their DNA via homologous recombination. This means that their DNA is only. Um, can only be repaired by the base excision repair machinery. So that means that overall, if you think of all of the cells in the body, overall, there are going to be more cells with DNA damage surviving 
and going on to divide and make more copies of themselves. Because although these two mechanisms can sort of back each other up, if in every single cell um, of the body that BRCA pathway is inactive, you will get more cells with mutations slipping through and ultimately it, this leads to an increased cancer risk. However, we can use this to our advantage um, when we're thinking of which drug treatments to use to treat BRCA mutated cancers. So PARP1 is a protein involved in this basic scission repair mechanism, so it's alternative to the BRCA mediated repair. So in BRCA mutated cells, inhibiting the protein PARP1 forms what we call a synthetic lethal interaction. So basically in the cells of the BRCA mutation, um, BRCA uh, mediated repair can't happen and basic scission repair via PARP1 can't happen. And so DNA damage accumulates in those cells and it's not repaired. And ultimately those cells will die because they've just got so many different things wrong with them and so many different mutations. The, cell, the body's normal um, sort of mechanisms for checking for mutations will just go, oh, this is really, really wrong. Loads of mutations here and that cell will be broken down and ultimately will not go on to form a tumour. So that's how we can use our understanding of mutations to select a treatment. So we wouldn't give a drug targeting the PARP protein to someone who doesn't have that BRCA mutation. So question time again. When might a targeted drug not work? So again, if you type your ideas in the chat and M can tell me what you're all thinking. We've not got any answers yet, so maybe. Um, oh, we've got one. If the body reject, re uh, if the body rejects the drug, um, <laughs> someone's put. If secondary tumors have already formed, mm -hmm. um, if a cancer has evolved to no no longer possess the proteins, so I guess if the cancer yep. mutated mm -hmm. uh, uh, around immunity, if it's targeting the wrong thing, mm -hmm. um, what else have we got? Uh, if it's managed to evade the drug. Uh, yep. So yeah, I guess, yeah, again, sort of changing. Uh, if the concentration of the target protein isn't high enough in the cell, mm -hmm. um, if the cancer's become resistant, yeah, I think we've covered a lot of, uh, another mutation might have occurred. Yeah, so we've got lots of things around the, mm -hmm. the cancer being resistant or the drug being not quite right. Fantastic, so lots of great ideas there. So something I'm going to mention, um, which is actually connected with um, what a lot of you are referring to there. So in cancer cells, we actually see something that we call tumor heterogeneity. So basically this just means that if you were to look at a, a tumor as a whole, some of the cells down this end will have some mutations and some of the cells up here will have slightly different mutations. Some of the cells down here will have slightly different mutations. So the mutations are not uniform throughout the tumor. There's a lot of variation and that's that those sort of differences are what we mean by heterogeneity. So this arises due to evolution and also what we call random genetic mutations. So within an individual tumor cell population, you can see a huge variety of um, genotypes. And this is something that we can study now really easily using genomics. So back to 20 years ago, when it would cost you a billion dollars to sequence one genome, so that's effectively one cell within a tumour, you could only sequence one cell. Now, because it's so much cheaper, you can actually take samples from different bits within the tumour and sequence them all individually. So what we actually see in patients in the clinic is heterogeneity at different levels. So we can see spatial heterogeneity. So someone was saying um, in the chat, the primary tumour, so the first tumour that formed, might behave differently and respond differently to drugs than the metastases, so the secondary tumours. That might be because they're in different um, physical locations within the body. They might have gone through evolution bottlenecks in those different situations. You can also get temporal heterogeneity, which is basically changes over time. 
So it might be that initially your patient presents in the clinic and their tumour is mainly these green cells with a couple of blue mutations as well. And actually when you give them the first drug treatment, that is an evolutionary bottleneck and selection arises. So actually that kills all the blue cells. Some of the green cells survive, but actually you get yellow cells predominating. And then again, when you give the next treatment, that will again change the makeup of that tumour over time. So we also see heterogeneity between patients with the same cancer type. So it's really important for clinicians when they get um, a clinic full of, say, patients with lung cancer to understand exactly what is causing that lung cancer in first patient versus second patient versus the third patient. So they need to devise really personalised treatment plans. So something a couple of people mentioned was drug resistance. So you may know from um, sort of GCSEs and things like that, antibiotic resistance in bacteria is a massive issue. Um, so as with bacteria in, and, and them evolving resistance to antibiotics, certain cancer cells will be resistant to the effects of certain type of cancer drugs. So they can either just be resistant from the word go, which is what we call innate resistance, or they can evolve and acquire resistance to a drug that's used on them. So as with antibiotics and bacterial disease, evolution of drug resistance can really reduce treatment options for that individual. And understanding the biology of resistance, so how that's arising, um, is key to identifying optimum treatment options. So when we're studying cancers, we need to use genomics to look at, say, the makeup of the tumour over time. So how many mutations are there? Is the frequency of mutations in a particular gene dropping as the patient becomes resistant to a drug? How does that relate to what's going on in the cell? So there are lots of different ways in which resistance can occur. So it might be alterations in the drug target. So I think someone mentioned that. So target might be down-regulated. That's important to know, to understand why a patient has stopped responding. Maybe um, also something quite interesting is drug influx and drug efflux. So basically in the cell membrane, there are pr proteins that basically pump out particular compounds. So the cell might have upregulated a particular type of pump that basically takes the drug molecules and pushes them out the cell. So obviously if the cell is doing that a lot more, the drug won't stay around within the cytoplasm long enough to actually act on the cell and kill the cell. So that's another important mechanism for drug resistance. And also you can get sort of different um, adaptive responses, different signaling patterns that can occur in response to, to drug treatments. So this evolution of resistance can be quite complex and there's a huge variety of mechanisms by which cells can evolve resistance to drug treatment. So going back to the example I showed earlier, so here we have the patient with the BRAF mutant melanoma. And when you looked in the middle, so this is after 15 weeks of treatment and the patient was looking really healthy, almost all of his tumours had gone, he looks much better, sort of colour and so on. However, a couple of weeks after these pictures in panel B were taken, his tumour started to, his tumour started to reappear again. So unfortunately, some of the cells from these initial tumours had survived in his body and were resistant or had evolved resistance to the BRAF inhibitor. So unfortunately, in his case, after a period of time, he did start to redevelop tumours again. So what I sort of hope that I've in conveyed to you in this talk is that genomics, which is understanding DNA, understanding um, genes and mutations, is key to understanding the biology of cancers. Also, genome, genomics is helping us develop new treatments for cancer, which hopefully will be more effective and also kinder and with fewer side effects for individuals. So thank you all for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you have on either what I've been talking about, cancer research in general, careers in science. 
up to you. So I think Emma is going to look at the chat and is going to pass questions on to me. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone's got questions for Lizzie, pop them in either the chat or the Q&A um, and we'll pull out some to ask. Um, someone's asked a really good one about CRISPR and DNA mm -hmm. um, and they've put the caveat of saying that they know that it's like asking how long a piece of string is, um, <laughs> but how long do you think it might be until we see CRISPR allowing uh, more affordable therapy for cancer? So I guess any anything that you can speak to on um, <laughs> on uh, on that would be would mm -hmm. obviously be <laughs> interesting. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, so I would say it depends what you mean by using CRISPR to make a treatment. So what we're doing in labs like the one I work in and labs all around the world is we're using CRISPR as an experimental tool. So basically we can use that to do an experiment and sort of see what happens when you effectively target a particular protein in a particular cell. And that's really, really fantastically useful because you can model and see what would happen and you can work out which protein you need to target um, in order to kill the cell. So it's really useful from that perspective. And that's actually already happening. What I think you were getting at from this question was, will CRISPR, CRISPR itself be used in the clinic? I would say, I don't think it's going to be used in the clinic in, in people, in patients. So what we see with CRISPR is that CRISPR is great for knocking out a particular gene, but actually it has a lot of what we call off-target effects. So it's almost like it has a lot of side effects. And I think it can be quite dangerous to think about using something like CRISPR in a patient, because obviously a human is incredibly complex. They've got millions of cells, different tissues. And you can imagine that if, say, um, you gave, you treated a human being with CRISPR, you don't know what that's going to do to their cells sort of five, 10 years down the line. You can imagine that if you gave a CRISPR treatment to say a woman who's pregnant, we don't know what it might do to say the developing fetus. It might harm that, it might um, cause developmental problems, all sorts of very, very complicated um, and very important issues to think about. Um, with regards to using CRISPR in patients. So I hope that answered. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they knew that it was a long short answer. So yeah. I, that was a very comprehensive answer. Um, <laughs> CRISPR is definitely an amazing uh, like option for, for new research. But yeah, there's lots of obviously things to think about. Um, there's been lots of sort of questions around, you know, uh, can mutations be prevented? Can cancers be sort of eradicated? Um, so yeah, anything around, around that? Um, so in terms of mutations being prevented. Um, so there are particular mutations that we know are quite common and quite commonly called specific cancers. So for example, there are particular patterns of mutations that we see in people that smoke. Um, so those patterns of mutations are quite often seen in people with lung cancer, if they've been smokers and they develop lung cancer. There's also specific patterns of um, mutations seen in skin cancers caused by UV light. So we can prevent those specific mutations happening by not smoking or by not going on sunbeds, wearing sunscreen, etc. cetera. Uh, so what was the other half of the question? Um, and then more generally, can do you think any types of cancer will ever be sort of eradicated? So that's a very good question. I would say yes. Um, so I mentioned testicular cancer, which has a uh, sort of 98 percent 10 year survival. And also, I think thyroid cancer has something like a 99 percent 10 year survival rate, which is fantastic. But for cancer survival rates, you always need there will always be cases where um, you can't necessarily treat cancer because, for example, the tumour's already spread to different tissues, it's already extremely advanced. So I think as long as we have ways of diagnosing and initially picking up those tumours, we can have very high cancer survival rates. Because for example, if someone has lung cancer and they, um, it's only diagnosed when it's already spread to say their bones, their brain, etc. Unfortunately, their treatment outcomes are not going to look very good. Whereas if you catch it early, it's much easier to treat and much better survival rates. 
Awesome. We've had a couple more general questions about sort of your work and sort of career path. So I wonder if you could sort of quickly say what what you did sort of at uh, A level or, or equivalent if you didn't do A level um, and sort of why you chose to go into science and specifically sort of cancer biology. Mm -hmm. Um, so for A level, which seems a very long time ago for me, um, I did biology, chemistry, maths and German. So I did mainly sciences. Um, I find medicine and sort of how drugs work really interesting. But I knew I didn't want to be a doctor, didn't want to study sort of veterinary medicine or dentistry or anything like that. So I love the science, but I didn't want to sort of deal with patients basically. <laughs> um, so that's why I chose to study biology at university. Um, I chose to focus on cancer research because I find it a really interesting scientific problem. So I mentioned antibiotics and antibiotic drug resistance. When you're developing a drug against a bacteria, that bacteria is a foreign foreign cell so it's foreign to the body so in a way it's almost easier to develop a drug against that when it's in the human body when you think about a cancer a cancer is a disease of the patient's own cells so they in 99.9% .9 of cases they look the same they behave very similarly and they have very similar genetics and similar uh, makeup to the healthy cells in the body. So I find that a very interesting scientific problem. How do you distinguish between the cancer cells and the healthy cells? So that's what interests me. Awesome. Um, and sort of, I guess, linked to that, someone's asked um, uh, whether, what sort of what you'd advise for anyone who's interested. And um, they, they asked sort of specifically around summer schools, which you probably don't know any off the top of your head, but more, more, more generally, if our audience is like interested in this, um, mm -hmm. are there any maybe books or uh, videos or resources that you know of that would be particularly interesting? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I definitely recommend um, is reading something like New Scientist. So you might have access to your school library or public library as well. Um, so that's a really good source because that goes through sort of the big in-depth scientific journals and sort of summarizes things in a sort of um, user-friendly format. Um, there's also a really good blog by the Wellcome Trust called, I think, Mosaic, which is really good. Um, so that sort of summarizes topics in sort of quite a sort of a user-friendly manner. So they don't use too much jargon and they've got podcasts and things as well. So I just explore the science, find something that really interests you. If you're really interested in, I don't know, ecology, really interested in sort of plant species or butterfly species or something like that, find what you're really interested in, what really excites you, makes you go, wow, this is fantastic. And then think about how you can study that at university. Awesome. I'll also put um, a, a little uh, link in the chat box just mm -hmm. now. Um, we okay. have a genomic textbook that um, Fran was involved in publishing, and you can win one on the link in the in the chat box just now. So um, I know that a couple of people who've been before um, have actually won them. Um, so yeah, do do fill that in if you'd like a nice overview book of mm -hmm. genomics in general. Um, let me see if I can pull out a couple more questions. There was a really good one. Um, Oh, I've lost it now. Um, someone's put, why do, are some animals like whales immune to cancer? Um, I don't know if this is anything you know anything <laughs> about, but. <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, so actually that is a big field of research because if you think about an animal like an elephant, so elephants can live sort of 60, 70 years, so about, about the same as human. Um, and elephants are massive, but you very, very, very rarely see an elephant with a cancer. Um, so that is, again, something that we can learn about from sequencing elephants' DNA. So actually, there is a um, particular protein that you may have heard of, um, which is quite frequently mutated in cancer, and that is called TP53. Um, and that basically stops a cancer forming in many cases. Elephants don't just have one copy of TP53, they have something really weird, like they have 23, that's probably the wrong number, but they have loads of copies of TP53. So I don't know how that's happened, why that evolved, but it's true. Um, so elephants very rarely get cancer. 
And that's how sort of looking at genomics from different animals can actually help us understand human biology as well. Yeah, and it's not, I mean, for, for the case of cancer, maybe elephants is a good one, but in genomics in general, we often look at other species and work out why has this species been able to do a thing that humans hasn't. Um, so that's definitely a really interesting sort of area of study. Um, someone uh, asked whether um, you think that in the in the future there might be something like a cancer vaccine that would help stop mm -hmm. people from even get, getting a mutation. Um, so that's a good question. Um, so something which is sort of quite closely related um, is obviously the HPV vaccine. So um, young people in schools um, nowadays get vaccinated against HPV, so human papillomavirus, which is associated with developing cervical cancers and some other cancers as well. So I'd say you could say that that's an anti-cancer vaccine. It's not directly preventing the cancer forming, but it's preventing the infection, which prevents the cancer forming. Um, there are other specific viruses associated with certain cancers. Um, so I don't, I don't exactly know if there are vaccines being developed against them, but in theory, you could do something like that. And I think, as you were saying, like because it's not just cancer as a hmm. as a one as a one -er, that yeah. all cancers are slightly <laughs> different. It might be that some you know vaccines might be appropriate for some and not for others. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds more like they'll be hopefully in the future, lots of different therapies and, and maybe vaccines and treatments available for different cancers. Absolutely. Um, someone asked, do you work in a lab? And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what maybe, uh, maybe not just not, not what your day to day looks like now, but what in normal times your day to day mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, work would look like. Yep. Um, so I am what's called a computational biologist. So I work on the genome campus, but I work in an office. So I'm sat at a computer all day, analyzing data, modeling data, looking at trends, looking at um, graphs and so on. Um, so I don't actually do any experiments myself. Um, so we also have a lot of scientists at the Wellcome, at the Sangman Institute who are what we call a wet lab scientist. So they're doing experiments with pets, doing sort of test tubes, things like that. Um, so typically, um, under normal circumstances, a day for me might be I get in at 9am, have a couple of meetings, maybe talk about projects, um, sort of plans for manuscripts. So that's what we call scientific papers that we're writing. I might talk to my collaborators. So we collaborate with lots of different labs from around the world. Um, I might also... Um, speak to someone from learning and development or someone from the outreach team. Um, I might also um, do some data analysis myself, read some papers as well, and then I go home about sort of half past five. So that's the day for me. <laughs> Uh, great. I think I think people I think there's still obviously a big um, thought that all scientists are in a lab doing what lab stuff. And obviously that is a huge part of what biology research is. Uh, so I think it's nice to hear the other side that once we've got all the data, we do actually have to do something with it. Um, there was a nice question on whether um, nanotechnology might be used in the future mm -hmm. of cancer. Uh, yeah, um, so um... I'm not an expert in that field, but yes, absolutely, nanotechnology is being used. Um, I believe there's lots of research into things like um, nanoparticles, particularly sort of gold nanoparticles, as um, sort of new therapeutic options. Um, I remember at my previous institute, some students doing some really cool work there um, on what they call photoacoustics. So basically, you shine a light on the tumour, and it basically makes the the nanoparticles sort of vibrate and it bursts tumor open things. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Very, very cool. I don't know when that sort of thing will be in the clinic, but yes, there, absolutely there is research going awesome. on. Um someone similarly asked, um, you mentioned that the cost of like doing a full genome sequence has come down so much. Um, do you see a time in the future where we routinely screen like everyone for genetic markers for four cancers, like as a routine, mm -hmm. like way before uh, any symptoms? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. So I think yes and no. So it might be that sort of when you go for your sort of annual health 
checkup or something like that, they sequence you or they might sequence you for particular mutations associated with breast cancer. So, you know, for things like um, women who are over a certain age have mammograms, they might sequence their DNA at the same time for particular breast cancer markers. Um, however, I don't think sort of general sort of sequencing everything all the time is going to come through to the clinic because um, there are also, also quite a few sort of ethical issues, which I'm sure M has access to lots of different resources on this. So things like um, if you know someone is likely to develop Alzheimer's, do they necessarily want to know that? Might it affect their lifestyle? Might it affect their life choices? Do they need to tell their children? Do they need to tell their partner? Things like that. So it's a big, potentially has lots of benefits. So regular sequencing but also it might reveal things that people don't necessarily want to know or might have negative consequences for them or their family or sort of how they're treated and so on. So it's a big, big ethical issue, but good question. I think that's the unique thing about genomics compared to sort of other things in, in healthcare that it, finding out your genetic code doesn't just tell you things about yourself it tells you things about your family so um it's more than just a uh, a one person uh, information you do learn mm. you know things about other other people in, in your uh, biological family um let me just find any other questions that we've not got around to there's been so many good ones um i think a lot of these that you have sort of touched on um, someone uh, asked again, sort of on the uh, university route, how did you decide between different degree names? So they've specifically said, but between biology and biological sciences. So um, I can't remember what exactly your degree name was called, but how did you pick that? And um, did the degree name itself matter to you? Um, I would say it depends very much on what your scientific interests are. So when you're looking and thinking about which universities to apply for, don't just say, oh, it's biology. That's, that's what I'm going to apply for because, um, so I have friends I was at university with who, for example, are really into ecology. So you could put them in a tent when it's in the pouring rain and they'll be sort of counting moths and things and they absolutely love it. That's exactly what they want to do. I would hate that, but if you, if they wanted to study ecology, the course they would want to pick at university would be very different to the course I would have wanted to do, studying genetics and biochemistry and cell biology. And both of those fall under biology. And it's a very diverse field. So it also includes things like psychology or um, more sort of medical things, uh, even more sort of chemistry. So biochemistry can be very very sort of technical getting into lots of physics and things like that so I'd think about what you're really interested in think about and research the actual topics covered in a biology degree because one university's biology degree might be very different to another one's so that's a short answer yeah I think I'd add um I definitely got really bogged down by what my degree title was when I was uh, at ALF and at university and it's much better as Lizzie said to look at the specific courses it offers and then whether you like the university because mm. you'll be there for three or four years so it might sound on paper like the best thing under the sun but if you don't like the place then it might not be the best environment for you mm -hmm. so um obviously if you want to go into a really specialist area the, the degree title itself might matter but on the whole the, the courses you study in the place it is definitely mo more important um I think that is pretty much all the I think we've covered most of the sort of types of questions that will come up I'm, I'm aware that is um coming up to half five so I think we'll stop there um but Lizzie thank you so much you've answered so many uh varied questions tonight that we've sort of thrown on the spot uh to you um so thank you very much for coming along um in the chat box, I'm going to add a series of links for everyone. These will also be on the email that you get afterwards. Um, but information about next week's talk, information about winning a textbook, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so as I said, they'll all be in the follow up email as well. So don't worry if you don't grab them all uh, there. But thank you very much for coming along tonight. Next week, we're joined by two um, 
two researchers who work in the lab and so we're going to be looking at how a tumour um, can be harvested, can be taken from patients uh, during biopsy, how it can be studied and how that can help us with um, drug development as well. So a nice follow on from what Lizzie was talking about today. Someone's just asked about certificates. If you um, have signed up via Eventbrite and ticked that you'd like a certificate. As long as you come to two or more sessions, you'll get a certificate at the end. If you want any more information, uh, just pop us an email and we'll make sure that you're on the right list. Um, but I will, um, yeah, I'll finish up there. Thank you so much, Lizzie. And thank you very much, everybody for coming along. Thanks for coming. <laughs>